I'm tempted to answer this question, how do I pray with the Nike answer, you know, just do it. And you can get all complicated about it and, and have all kinds of forms and structures and rules and regulations and, and miss the whole point of prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is just being in the presence of God and conversing. I, I, don't, need, I don't need to be told how, occasionally I do, but I, I shouldn't need to be told how to sort of have a conversation with my wife. And sometimes I don't even need to have a conversation. I can just sit and be in her presence. Sometimes we say to each other, can we just not talk? And there's an element of prayer that is like that, meditative prayer. But we are meant to talk to God and he talks back to us. There's a book by Don Whitney, um, Praying the Bible, reading through the Bible and turning what you read into prayer. It's a very simple thing to do, just read one verse and turn it back into a prayer to God. It's like a two-way conversation. There are times in my life when prayer has been difficult. There have been times when I felt my prayers were hitting a ceiling and bouncing back again. Times of stress, times of trial, times of difficulty. Sometimes God withdraws the light of his countenance for a season to make us want him more and to be glad when he returns. And in those periods, what do you do? In those darker periods, just walk through the Bible and turn each verse back into a prayer. Good counsel, isn't that? To walk through the Bible and turn each verse back into prayer simple. Hope you're able to maybe consider that at your morning devotions or your own personal Bible study time, uh, to walk through the Bible and turn each verse back into prayer. Well, a couple of forthcoming events. First, the Jackson County Right to Life is having their program this year at the First Baptist Church on Sunday evening January the 24th at 6 p.m. As you enter the hallway, there's some literature that uh, Ted Josouth set out, or catch Ted, and he will give you more of the details of the event. <clears throat> Today, we are back to Sunday school, Sunday school for the two-year-olds all the way up to the uh, sixth graders. And uh, those of you who may be new to the, how it all, the structure of how it works, uh, about midway through this our worship time, the, the students will all meet their teachers and assistants back in the corner of the gym, head up to class. They'll be brought back down right at the conclusion of the sermon. Then on January the 30th, BCC has scheduled a Protect Our Children seminar led by the Children's Advocacy Center here in Medford. All Sunday school teachers and assistants and parents and those who are interested in protecting children are invited to a two-hour training here in this building upstairs at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, the 30th of January. Well, now, may would you please greet Cameron, Rachel, and one more month old to the day, Charles Ted Herna. Born in Grants Pass, Thursday, December to the 10th uh, at 8 13 in the morning, and uh, he was right on at 9 pounds and 22 inches long, and it's really, really a joy to introduce Charlie to the church family this morning. Well, thank you for bringing him here, traveling down. I bet they traveled the furthest of anyone this morning from the center part of Grants Pass to be here this morning, and uh, thank you for being here. Psalm 145 proclaims how great are the Lord's works towards us. The first four verses say, I will extol you, my King and my God, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. 
one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts, especially creating little boys named Charlie. Would you stand if you're able and let's pray together for this sweet family. Oh God, our Father, we give you thanks with our whole hearts for the appearance of Charles Ted Herna. We do this with his father and mother and loved ones near and far and as a church family this morning. We do so because you have displayed your mighty acts through this home, studied by all here this morning to delight in your name. Once again, you have placed before us a magnificent display of your unsearchable greatness. Charlie, who did not exist except in the mind of his creator, is now a living, breathing, thinking, moving, growing little boy who will exist for your good pleasure. We extol and praise you, Father, and thank you for giving him specifically to Cameron and Rachel. Oh God, help those that are standing and watching. It's very clear this morning we need your help. Help us as a people to be faithful, to encourage, to befriend, to contact, to love, drive 25 miles north, and to be there for this new family of three. In you we put our hope because of your greatness for generations of Hernas and other Jesus followers to come, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you too for bringing your sweet little one-month-old, one-month-old today son to share him with us. <clears throat> well, now that you're standing and you're able, uh, would, you, would you hear this morning's call? To worship. The mighty one who created a little boy like Charlie, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Let's praise him.
when Christ our life appears. When Christ our life appears, our hope will be complete. Our longings finally rest as we fall at His feet. When Jesus comes to reign, restoring everything, our tears will turn to tides of praises to our King. We're longing for that day when we'll see. As mercy overcomes, the Savior will renew what sin had torn apart. His light will drive the shadows from our weary hearts. We're longing for that day when we'll see. Built on nothing. 
healing lands in Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging. seated. Well, it's our joy to dine at the Lord's table. If you didn't get a a cup, go ahead and raise your hand and someone will bring one to you. And just want to remind you that this meal is for those who have trusted in Jesus. And Scripture even warns that we not approach this meal in an unworthy manner. So, If you don't know Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about what it means to trust in him as your Lord and Savior, but uh, don't partake in this if that's the case. I want to think about the song that we just sang and ask on what is our hope built? Jesus' blood and righteousness plus anything, plus the president, plus the Senate majority plus our rights as American citizens, what, on what is our hope built? Is it truly nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? His blood shed for us. His blood that paid the price for our sins. His blood that enables us to be forgiven by God the ultimate judge of all mankind? Do we trust him? Does anything else really compare to this? Or do we maybe take this for granted? Do we check the box of salvation and then live for our rights or our wealth or our comfort? And when these things are threatened, when we see very disappointing things occurring around us, in what, in whom do we build our hope? 
So I, I don't say this to put any kind of guilt trip on you, but I want us to come back as Christians and ask ourselves this because in this meal, we find grace. In this meal, we rest in Christ. Our hope is in his blood. It's in his righteousness alone. For those who are in Christ, we are forgiven. We are forgiven because of his shed blood. We are declared to be righteous, righteous because of his perfect obedience to the law. And that is a sweet and wonderful truth. So if we acknowledge this and trust Christ alone, then his righteousness becomes ours and no earthly circumstance. Yes, there's disappointment, but we come back to what is our hope. No earthly circumstance should overwhelm us and rob us of this hope. And we can sing when darkness seems to hide his face. I rest. I rest on his unchanging grace. This meal is a means of grace. Rest on it. Put your hope in him. For those who are in Christ, there is a reality, a hope, a strengthening and reassuring grace. So when we eat and when we drink, eat and drink as those who are receiving God's grace. Eat and drink as those who look to Christ for all things to be made right. But before we do this, let's take a couple of minutes and pray silently, pray with hope because of Jesus, pray with honest confession. If you've looked to anything else but Christ, let's go to him and confess and thank him for his grace. Let's take a few minutes now. hope you realize that Jesus is with us. Yes, he's always with us and dwelt by his spirit, but this is, a, this is a special meal, and his presence is unique. This is his meal. And as we receive this grace, this blessing from him, we remember the word of God that tells us that Jesus took bread on the night when he was betrayed, and he gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. He also took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Um, and please join me at, at a point in this prayer as we pray the Lord's Prayer as well. But let's begin. Father, we confess that there are many things in which we trust. There are many people and circumstances that let us down and bring discouragement. But we are reminded here today that only your son Jesus is worthy of our ultimate hope. 
Only Jesus is worthy of our confidence and praise. And so we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand and let's continue to worship our great God. kids here. We have some kids. Uh, you guys can head off to class. Um, otherwise, we'll uh, do one more song and uh, receive the preaching of the word. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone. But in the costly wounds of love at the cross My worth is not in skill or name In win or lose, in pride or shame But in the blood of Christ that flow at the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. I 
soul is satisfied in Him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I will not boast in health or mind. Or human wisdom to But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. And I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Just the voices. And I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Bear Creek Church. My name is, is Pastor Bill Pritchett. I'm so getting used to saying it that way. So. You know, every week, uh, Pastor Brian puts together an, an order of service, and, uh, you know, we've always had PD, PJ, and PB, so uh, for me, it has PB2, so I guess that's what I will go by from now on. Uh, Whether you are here in person or watching online, we're we're certainly glad that you're with us today. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to please open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. We're going to be taking a look at verses 1 through 18 together. Chapter 10, Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. You know, people have made jokes about people like Charles Spurgeon who could preach a a six-part sermon or a six-sermon series on, on one verse Maybe even just one word from that verse. Pastor Brian, a few weeks ago, did an entire sermon on the verse, Jesus wept. So I don't know what it says about me that I have to use 18 verses to try to make my point. But either way, here we go. So Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities... It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will. O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law, then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. 
And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this time this morning. I pray that as we are in your word, it will be an encouragement to each of us. We acknowledge that it feels like there are so many things going on in the world around us that could occupy our thoughts. Yet we ask that you help us now to set those thoughts aside and spend time focused on you and your word. We submit this all to you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, the book of Hebrews is certainly one of my favorite books. In fact, the truth is we would do well to do a study of the entire book. Now, that's not the plan for today, so don't worry. I remember studying this book one time, and I read several different commentaries and listened to several different messages. And when the topic of, of authorship came up, it's generally agreed that we don't know who the author is. You have various theories. Some say it was Paul. Some say it was Apollo. Some say it was Peter. Some say it was this, that, or another person. Some point to the structure of how the books of the New Testament are laid out. You have the four Gospels. You have a book of history and the book of Acts. And then you have letters with all of Paul's letters grouped together, then the general letters to follow. So the question becomes, is the book of Hebrews or excuse me, does the list of Paul's letters end with the book of Hebrews? Or do the general letters start with Hebrews? In one commentary I read that we don't know who the author is. The only thing we are certain about is that it was not Paul. Seems pretty definitive. Then I listened to a message from someone who I have a lot of respect for and their theological understanding saying that he believed Paul to be the author. So we don't know. We have our opinions, but we don't know. So for our purposes this morning, we'll refer to the author simply as that, as the author or the writer of the book of Hebrews. So let's, let's jump in. What we're going to do is we're going to read through this again, more verse by verse, and then talk about it as we go. To begin, though, I'd like to start a couple of verses back. So I guess I really needed more than 18 verses to make my point. Uh, but go to chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now we look again at verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So a a relationship is established here, a connection between the old covenant and the new covenant, and the good things that are still to come. The writer of Hebrews says that the law was no more than a shadow of the heavenly realities. By shadow, the writer means a sketch or an outline. The Greek term translated shadow refers to a pale reflection as contrasted with a sharp or a distinct one. So as an example, we may think about being out on a walk, and we see the shadow of a tree on the sidewalk or the road. It may be an especially sunny day, and so the shadow is really distinct. We can look at the shadow and see that it's a shadow from a tree, but we don't fully appreciate the beauty of the tree based on the shadow. There are some details from the tree that are not present in the shadow. We don't see all the amazing colors of the tree in the shadow. We see the outline. We see enough to recognize it for what it is. 
but we don't fully appreciate all that it is. We may also think of a picture. Maybe you have a picture that you keep of somebody close to you, somebody special to you. Maybe when you're not near that person, you look at the picture, and the picture, it brings you comfort. When I worked at the bank, I would travel out of town, usually up to Seattle, for meetings or trainings. And when I'm traveling without Jessica, I miss her. So I like to pull up pictures I have of her on my phone. When I'm not with her and I miss her, it can be of some comfort to look at a picture of her. You can see much of her beauty in the picture. So there are things in the Old Testament that were a picture of things to come. They had their purpose, but they could also be lacking. They were but a shadow of the good things to come. Now, the main emphasis here has to do with the the roughness of the picture available to the Old Testament saints. John Calvin explains that the things of the law were like the rough outlines, which which are the foreshadowing of the living picture. Before they put on the true colors with paint, artists usually draw an outline in pencil of the representation which they intend. Such was the shadow that was the Old Covenant. So in the old system, we see the institution of the tabernacle. Okay, God goes, okay, I'm going to institute the tabernacle because I can't let sin go unpunished. I can't let sin go unpunished because I'm just. So I'm going to institute the tabernacle. I think that was a pretty good impersonation, if you ask me. And the tabernacle, it was the situation where they would come in and they would talk to the priest and say, I've sinned against God. And so to deal with this past sin... That's important. Blood had to be shed. So they would kill an animal. And this pattern was then repeated over and over and over again. But the problem is, according to even our text in Hebrews 10, is it didn't work. And what happened was the people got stuck in what I'm going to describe as sort of a ritualistic religion that did not set them free from the shame, guilt, and sin in their hearts. So they got stuck in this ritualistic behavior of the tabernacle and were never set free. So they're kind of doomed to week after week after week, year after year after year, do the same religious things that brought about the same results. Now we also see in verse 1 that it says, make perfect those who draw near. Now the perfection the writer has in mind does not involve a lack of flaws, thankfully but rather a state of right relationship with God in which the worshipers are once and for all cleansed from sin and delivered from a nagging sense of guilt. The fact that the old covenant system cannot deliver in this regard as demonstrated by offerings made year after year shows the need for a different or a better system. Now, I want to I stop for just a moment so that I can make something clear. What we're talking about here is sacrifices and and the need for sacrifices. New sacrifices for new sins. In the old covenant, they would commit a sin and then a sacrifice was needed in order to deal with that sin. Then they would go off and they would commit another sin. And then a new sacrifice was needed to deal with that sin. We shouldn't confuse this today with the need to go before the Lord and ask for forgiveness for our sin. A new sacrifice is not needed every time we sin, but out of love and obedience and reverence before the Lord, we acknowledge our sin and ask for forgiveness as a part of repentance. Those are two different things. Okay, back to our text. As one commentator noted, the Mosaic law with its priesthood, covenant, sacrifices, and tabernacle can never make a person perfect since it is but a shadow of the true form which is found in Christ and his final sacrifice. We'll talk more about that later. So an an effective thing does not need to be done again. That's what makes it effective. The very fact of the repetition of these sacrifices is the final proof that they are not purifying men's souls and not giving full and uninterrupted access to God. So to me, that begs the question, Why then did God go to all the trouble to establish the Old Covenant with its shadow ceremonies, its shadow rituals, its shadow sacrifices? What was the point? If it was lacking, then why establish it? I think there were a few main reasons, but I'll quickly mention three. 
The first was simply that even as a shadow, it had a purpose to reflect the reality of which it was the shadow. It was, it was pointing to a salvation that was to come. It was what, sorry, it was to make God's people expectant. 1 Peter 1.10 references the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. Second, the purpose of the shadow sacrifices was to remind God's people that a penalty for sin had to be paid and that the penalty of sin is death. The blood that flowed from the altar came from animals who were killed as sacrifices for sin. The people were constantly being reminded that the wages of sin is death because death was going on all day long throughout their history as animals were being slaughtered. Third, God gave his people the sacrifices as a covering for sins. So they served a purpose in the immediate dealing with that sin. They did deal with that sin. They did cover that sin. Even a shadow is better than nothing if it can, to some degree, cover sin. If it's a hot day, some shade is good, even if it's not fully satisfying. When properly offered from a true heart of faith, the old sacrifices removed immediate temporal judgment from God. Those sacrifices were temporal and they had some temporal effect in value. So we're, we're establishing a little bit of a foundation here, so don't worry, we'll be picking up the pace as we go through our passage. But let's keep going, let's look at verse 2. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. Or in the NIV it says, the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. If sin had really been overpowered by that system of sacrifices, the Old Testament believers' consciences would have been cleansed from condemning guilt. There was not freedom of conscience of guilt under the Old Covenant. So the conscience of sin has to do with guilt. There's a certain amount of guilt that comes with sin. It's just a system that's built into us, just like pain is built into us, where pain reacts to bodily injury, guilt reacts to the injury of our soul by disobedience to God. And it's a warning system. And they never in the Old Testament were ever relieved from the tension of guilt. It's a wonderful thing in the Christian life to know that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing to be free from guilt and to recognize that your sins are continually being forgiven by the grace of God through the death of Christ. But they didn't have that freedom. They had a tension. They were torn between what they knew was God's law and the consciousness of guilt that they always had because they always broke his law. See, with their, with their shadow, the animal sacrifices could cover but never remove sin. That removal of sin is what we need. Sin and guilt eat away at us. But the old system could not remove sin or guilt. If it could have, then sacrifices would have stopped. Once having removed sin, they would no longer be necessary. They would not need to keep sacrificing. The old sacrifice not only did not remove sin, but they were a continual reminder that they could not. Let's keep going. Verse 3. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Even the covering of sin was temporary. It lasted only until the next sin. The Old Testament sacrifices not only could not remove sin, but their constant repetition was a constant reminder of that deficiency. The promise of the new covenant was that sin would be removed and even God would remember our sins no more. The sacrifices pointed not to themselves as a solution, but away from themselves. Their main teaching was not what they could do, but what they could not do. William Barclay explains this with a simple analogy. He said, a man is ill. A bottle of medicine is prescribed for him. If that medicine affects a cure, every time he looks at the bottle thereafter, he will say, that is what gave me back my health. On the other hand, if the medicine is ineffective, every time he looks at the bottle, he will be reminded that he is still ill. It may sometimes give relief from the symptoms, but it does nothing to cure the disease. 
So again, the old sacrifices and ceremonies, instead of removing sins, they only gave temporary relief and were a constant reminder that their sins were still there. Another year, another lamb, another sacrifice, and the sins were still there. The sacrifices kept reminding the people that they were sinful and that they were at the mercy of God and could not enter into his presence. Far from erasing sin, the tabernacle and temple sacrifices only served to call attention to it. Now let's keep going. We've got an interesting thing happening because God said, hey, sacrifice these bulls and goats for the removal of sin. We could look back into Leviticus for this. And now you've got God saying in verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Not permanently. And he's going to explain it. Verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. So God's going, I don't want your bull and I don't need your goats. That's not what I want. That does not please me. I'm not after your sacrifice. I'm after your hearts. The doing of his will. Let's jump back a little and take a look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. Hebrews 9 verses 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, saying that Christ is the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. These sacrifices only sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, the external. But the blood of Christ, who through the external spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanses our consciences, the internal. So how how do we reconcile this? We basically have God saying that he does not desire sacrifices and offerings when he was the one who established these very ordinances as a way to draw near, near to him in the Old Covenant. I think one thing to consider is the many prophetic passages expressing God's displeasure with sacrificial ritual. These warnings do not condemn the sacrifices themselves, but instead the hypocrisy of those who simply went through the motions without any heart involvement. A good example of this comes from Psalm 51, where David cries, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. The same might be said today about people who go through the motions of worship, As Jesus taught to the woman at the well, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. But there's another fundamental point being made. Perhaps the the best Old Testament example comes from the story of King Saul. Saul had disobeyed an explicit command of God not to take captive any livestock from his enemies. When Samuel challenged him for this, Saul offered to sacrifice a few of his contraband animals to God, kind of paying him off, as it were. To which Samuel responds with, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. So Samuel's point and the point of our passage is that even though God established the sacrifice, sacrifices of animals, these were not God's true desire. They were not a statement of the solution, but of the problem. What God desires from us is obedience, not sacrifices to cover our disobedience. 
The sacrifices cover our sin, they do. And we thank God that they do, but God making a way to deal with our sin is not to be confused with saying that this was how he desired it to be. The sacrifices showed the constant presence and horrid nature of sin. Every time a lamb's breast was opened and the blood flowed down the altar, this point was made. This was not what God desired. No, what God desires is heart obedience from the people bought with his love. While this is not a perfect example, let me try to illustrate my point. If when my kids were really little and they were sitting on a couch with a drink and I asked them to be careful so that they don't spill, then they are not careful and they spill the drink and then they go and grab a towel to clean it up. I'm thankful that there's a towel to clean it up and that was the point of having a towel. But my desire was that they not need the towel. My desire was that they were careful and not spill the drink in the first place. Obedience pleases God. He is satisfied by a heart eager to do his will, by a life expressing the character of God set forth in the Ten Commandments, or as Jesus summarized them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is what God wants. And so God is saying, if you're giving me your bulls and goats and not your heart, I'm not interested in your sacrifice or offering to me. Now let's keep going. Verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. So now you've got Jesus coming and, and he's saying, this old way of you trying to, to do what you know is, is right, this old way of you trying to barter with me all the time, this old way of you coming into my temple and going, I've blown it. Here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do better. I'm going to stop doing this. Or here, take this sacrifice. Let this sacrifice appease you for my failures. Jesus is saying, I'm removing the old system, and I'm establishing a new one. Now let's, let's read about this new one, because this new one, it's great, great, great news for us today. Verse 10, and by that will, or the will of Jesus to come, remove the old system and establish a new, and by that will we have been sanctified. Now this word sanctified simply means to put in to put in the proper place. So sanctification is God taking our hearts and lives and placing them in that place where they are created to walk and dwell. It's becoming more and more like Christ. John MacArthur said this, sanctification is the progressive disconnect in the life of a believer from sin and towards righteousness. So back to verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Did you notice the word once? That's important. Not like the old system where we had to keep going back for a new sacrifice, but with Jesus, it was once for all. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So here's something really unusual about the tabernacle. There were no chairs. You weren't allowed to sit down, specifically if you were a priest. If you were a priest, you couldn't sit down because sitting down in the tabernacle would be symbolic of work being finished. So a priest was never allowed to sit down in the tabernacle because his work was never done. Because people, no matter how many offerings they brought in, could never have the guilt, fear, shame, depression, overwhelming sense of emptiness removed from them because God was not after goats and bulls. He was after their hearts. And so he's saying here, priests would always offer these sacrifices, but they were never able to sit down because their work was partial, not complete, lacking, and never finished. Now we get to what is one of my favorite verses of Scripture, Hebrews 10, 12. 
But when Christ had offered for all time, let me ask you a question. How much time is incorporated in all time? All of it, right? Which means that the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross covered sins of the past, because that's all of time, the present, because that's included in all time, and the future, because that's all of time. So the sacrificial death of Christ covered once and for all, all sins. So again, 10, 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. So in verse 11, the priests stand daily. Day after day they stand, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. But Jesus, once for all, offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. And he sat down. His work was complete and finished. So in verses 11 and 12, we see the old and the new are contrasted. Thousands of priests versus one priest. The old priest continually standing versus the sitting down of the new. Repeated offerings versus the once-for-all offering and the ineffective sacrifices that only covered sin versus the effective sacrifice that completely removes sin. Jesus dies on the cross, is resurrected from the dead, and sits down and says, it is over. He said, it is finished. It is over. So let's keep going. Verse 13. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So in verse 12, it said that at the right hand of God, and then we see in 13, a footstool for his feet. And this calls us back to Psalm 110, where it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the writer of Hebrews is showing that the securing of full and final forgiveness of sins has been accomplished. It is finished. Verse 14, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Perfected for all time does not mean that believers are now already sinless, but that Christ has fully earned their perfection. The eternal perfection of the saints stems from the once for all nature of Jesus' sacrifice. Hence, believers look to Christ and not to themselves for a cleansed conscience full forgiveness of sins, and total flawlessness in the future. For those of you who are, who are believers in Christ, let me ask you a question. How many of your sins were future sins when Jesus died on the cross? I'm going to guess all of them, unless some of you are older than I thought. So that on the cross of Jesus Christ, your sins, my sins, covered by the blood of Christ so that we stand perfect before the living God. That's unbelievably hard to get our minds around. So let's keep reading. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. So no longer is the law an external thing that's put on top of us that we have to bear externally, but now he'll write it on our hearts. One commentary said, the internalization of God's laws means that God's people now do his will, not yet perfectly, but in intention and endeavor by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now look at the, the next two. These next two are huge. Verse 17. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin." says, I will remember their sins no more. Indicates that Christ's single new covenant offering was eternal. And such forgiveness means there is no longer any other offering for sin. The new covenant's superiority to the old is shown most clearly in the full and final forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 18 again. Where there is forgiveness of these, 
where Christ has come alive in our hearts, where Jesus has saved us, there is no longer any offering for sin. So what just happened is Jesus says, where I've come into your heart, into your life, I'm no longer taking offerings. It's over. It is finished. I think we we struggle with the idea that we no longer give offerings. We try to give gifts to God to accomplish what he's already accomplished. And we bring them as though God needs them, as though we've contributed something. We can be like King Saul and try to pay God off, so to speak. I remember as a little kid, I didn't have any money of my own to buy Christmas gifts. I was probably like five years old. So I went into each person's room and I would grab something that was theirs and then I'd wrap it up and I'd give it to them. So for example, you can imagine my dad's surprise when he opened up a dirty 9 16th inch wrench for my brother who got a used pencil. I felt good and accomplished because I was giving something that they wanted. I knew they wanted it because it was theirs to begin with. But it really did nothing. I was just giving them something they already had. See, the gospel is it's amazingly complicated and yet amazingly simple. It is finished. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father because it was done. It is finished. We want to try to earn our salvation, but we can't. And I know that some people don't like that. People like the rules. They like the law. They like the tabernacle. Many of us would prefer to just have a list of do these things and don't do these things, and then we check it off, and once we're done, it's, it's, that's when it's over. We may feel like a debt was paid, and now we have to work to pay off that debt. But that's not it. We are guilty of sin. And the penalty for our sin that we are guilty of has been paid. It's not like we got off on a technicality. We were found guilty. But the penalty has already been paid. It's done. It is finished. The good news of the gospel is amazingly complicated and yet amazingly simple. Now, we could be done here. We could have just had a message that's the gospel and be done. You know, I've heard Bob Scott say before that nobody complains when the sermon is too short. So we could just end it here. But there's just one problem. See, you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. And because we're all sinners, sometimes we hear a message on grace. We hear a message on the gospel. We hear a message where we are reminded that it is finished. And we can then be tempted to begin to take on a a cheap grace mentality. A viewpoint that says it doesn't matter what I do if I sin or not. So I'm I'm already forgiven, so I'm just going to do whatever I want. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's over. The penalty has been paid. So it doesn't matter what I do. We hear a message on the gospel, and sometimes we take it as a license to sin. But if we take an attitude that says it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what's in our hearts, then we don't fully grasp who God is. As we've already said, God cares about our obedience. Now, I will say this about us. We are really, really, really good at recognizing sin and taking sin seriously. Actually, let me say that a different way. We are really, really, really good at recognizing and taking seriously other people's sin. And conversely, really, really good at minimizing and justifying or being blind to our own sin. We can explain sin away, can't we? We do it all the time when we say things like, well, I'm not gossiping. I'm just keeping you informed so you can pray. I'm not, I'm not gossiping or complaining. I'm just venting. I'm not being manipulative. No, I'm just helping you so that you would know what you should do. We explain away our sin as a way to minimize our own sin. And when we do this, we play a very dangerous game. It can allow us to compartmentalize our sin and convince ourselves that this is just, it's just our thing. It doesn't hurt anybody. Minimizing our sin is saying that ultimately our sin doesn't really matter because it's not a big deal. Minimizing our sin minimizes the cross. 
When I was in college, I, I struggled with this pattern of compartmentalizing, of acting as though what I was doing in one part of my life didn't have an impact on another area of my life. So when I was in college, I was a Christian. I was at church most every Sunday morning and many Wednesday evenings. We would sing worship, open the word, and it was wonderful. It was really wonderful. However, I also had a huge problem with alcohol at this time in my life. I had zero self-control when it came to the use of alcohol. I was able to convince myself that what I did on Friday and Saturday night had no bearing on what I did on Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. Thankfully, by the grace of God, he convicted me of this hypocrisy. It should scare us. Compartmentalizing our sin or minimizing our sin should scare us. It should scare us if we don't hate our sin. It should scare us into being open and transparent with one another, afraid of what sin we might be minimizing or what sin we act as though it doesn't matter. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 13 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin. Do we think about it that way? When we compartmentalize our sin, when we make excuses for it, when we ignore conviction, we begin to harden our heart to our own sin. When we take an approach that says, what I do over here doesn't matter and certainly doesn't impact what I'm doing over there, we're deceiving ourselves. The good news of the gospel is not that I can do whatever I want to do because it doesn't matter. It's not that Jesus sat down, so it's done, so if I sin, it doesn't matter, so I'm, I might as well just keep sinning, might as well keep doing whatever I want. It's not freedom to do whatever we, whatever we want, but freedom to do as we should. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we are now adopted by God because of Jesus and what he has done. If we act as though our sin doesn't matter, then we've missed who God is. He desires our obedience, but looks to Jesus and thus sees us as righteous. We were lost, justly condemned, but God saved us through Christ and declared us just. We talked in the beginning about having a picture. We said that sometimes you, you have a picture that you keep of somebody close to you, somebody special to you, and when you're not near that person, it can be of a comfort to, to take a look at that picture. I will look at a picture of Jessica when I'm out of town, and that picture, it does bring comfort. But here's the problem with the picture. The problem is that ultimately, it doesn't satisfy. We cannot sit and have a conversation with a picture. The picture doesn't encourage us when we're down. We don't hold a picture the same way we do the person. The picture causes us to long for the real thing. The picture causes us to long for something better. The picture may satisfy for a little while, but ultimately it creates a longing in us for something more. The old covenant system caused a longing for the good things to come, for Jesus. But many of us are perfectly content to worship the shadows, to keep God at arm's length, to worship the pictures of Christ and not worship Christ. Often, I think, in our lives, we are very content with the pictures. Because even though we profess to be a Christian in 2021, we don't actually know Jesus. We have lied to ourselves and convinced ourselves and deceived ourselves that these pictures or the substitutes are good enough. We go through the motions Therefore, we're a Christian. We acknowledge a God. Therefore, we're a Christian. We come to church, and therefore, we're a Christian. God desires our obedience every day of the week, not just on Sunday mornings. God is not after our bulls and goats. He is after our hearts. So we, we rest in the gospel and the good news of the gospel that though I am guilty of sin, Christ died and paid the penalty. I am forgiven. I cannot earn my salvation. Jesus already did. It is finished. Yet, 
I have to guard my heart against a mindset of, therefore, it doesn't matter what I do, so why even try to honor God? God desires my obedience all of the time, every hour of every day of every week. Yet I know that I will fall short, and when I do, I rejoice in the gospel. But that doesn't mean that I don't try, that I don't work at obedience. I don't say, well, I'm going to fall short anyway, so just forget it. It doesn't even matter. We have to get out of our heads the idea of perfection in our walk. We are not perfect, yet some of us can think that if if I can't do it perfectly, why even try? Remember what we said before when the writer of Hebrews said, perfected for all time. That does not mean that believers are now already sinless, but that Christ has fully earned our perfection. Perfection does not mean a lack of flaws on our part, but rather a state of right relationship with God. We rely on Christ's righteousness, but an aspect of our salvation is sanctification, growing more and more like Christ. So how can we take from that that it doesn't matter what we do, and so let's just keep sinning all we want? Now, we're not talking about failures. We all have failures. No, what we're talking about is embracing sin making room for it in our lives and saying that it doesn't matter. Christ bore our sin on the cross. He bore the penalty. He turned aside God's judgment, God's wrath from us and canceled sin. See, the gospel is not about us. The gospel is about Jesus, what he did, his life of perfect obedience, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. The penalty for our sin has been paid, and the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed to us. Yes, your sins, my sins, they are forgiven. But that should be a comfort for our shortcomings, not an excuse to indulge in our depravity. Our faith in Christ should cause us to forsake sin and to grow in him. But if our understanding of the cross is viewed as an excuse to sin, then we should pray for a changed heart. The gospel is good news. Our sins are already paid for. They're forgiven. It is finished. Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, and so we respond with obedience to the Father. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we have had this time to be in your word this morning. That we can go to your word for deep truths, rich, meaty. Father, we pray that we will have understood them well. Equip us, Lord, not only to to better understand our wonderful relationship with you, but to better be able to communicate that relationship to others, especially during this time. What people need to hear, what the world needs is Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for salvation. Oh, what a glorious salvation is ours. How thrilling it is to know in our hearts and lives that you have redeemed us in this way and secured us forever and that there is, apart from Jesus Christ, no salvation in any other name. We ask that you work in our hearts to increase our desire to be obedient to you. We thank you that that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We ask that you work in our hearts to respond to that truth in praise and not selfishness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand if you are able. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Precious Redeemer and friend Who would have thought that a lamb Could rescue the souls of men Oh, you rescue the souls of men Counselor, Comforter, Heaper Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one. 
give healing and grace Our hearts always hunger for Oh, our hearts always hunger for Almighty, infinite Father Faithfully loving your own Here in our weakness you find us Falling before your throne Oh, we're falling before your throne You are the one that we praise You are the one we adore Hearts always hunger for, oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the one that we praise, you are the one we adore. You give healing and grace, our hearts always hunger. For oh, our hearts always hunger for. We send you out with a benediction from the book of Ephesians. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, and all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. Or feel free to help put away. If you want to. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore.